Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We are so excited to host this TAGT Fall Parent Webinar. Uh, my name is Paulina Van Eden Hill, Executive Director of the Texas Association for the Gifted and Talented, or TAGT. TAGT is your association and exists to connect and empower parents and educators to meet the unique needs of gifted individuals through awareness, advocacy, and action. Today, we're so excited to host you and hundreds of GT parents from around the state and nation. Whether you're watching from your living room or are surrounded by parents from your area, hopefully you feel connected and empowered by this community. Parenting a gifted student comes with so many challenges and opportunities. Know that TAGT is here as a resource for you through our parent information, TAGT affiliated parent support groups, events, and an online community to, help, community to help you understand your gifted student and their needs. TAGT offers flexible memberships, including the e-subscriber option that includes access to our digital resources, weekly news emails, legislative updates, and more. We also support all TAGT parents and educator members through professional learning opportunities online, such as this, and in person so that they can also be a resource to you and your student. Visit txgifted.org and txgifted.org slash parents for more information. All right, now for the main event. Today we are joined by Ben Koch, CEO of New Minds, as we discuss helping students find their element. Ben is driven to unite people to a greater vision and cause in education and self-development. Through coaching, teaching, and delivering progressive workshops and talks, he seeks to expand horizons in education, leadership, and personal development. Driven to make a broader impact, he left the traditional classroom in 2013 and co-founded New Minds as a vehicle to drive the evolution in learning for the 21st century. Ben holds a BA in Rhetoric and Professional Communication from Iowa State University and a Master's Degree in Gifted Education from Southern Methodist University. After several years in the software industry thriving in communications and international project management roles, he entered the classroom and spent a decade working with students from kindergarten to college, which sparked his passion for changing lives. He's a published author, and in his spare time, he runs ultra marathons, sweats in hot yoga, and writes poetry, but not all at the same time. Please welcome Ben. We do. All right, so we are good to go. Happy, awesome. happy Tuesday, everyone. I wanna thank you for tuning in and kind of echo um, TAGT's welcome. Um, I really appreciate and respect the proactivity you're taking as a parent and kind of taking part in sessions like this. And our job tonight, our goal tonight is to inspire and spark you as a parent to be an even more effective advocate for your gifted child. Okay, so tonight's topic, finding your element. And you can see the subtitle here, nurturing passion changes everything. So a big topic tonight is gonna be about nurturing passion, following your passion, um, and it's one of those topics, right, where it's kind of a truism, like who's, who's going to deny that we, should f that we should follow our passions? It's one of those things that when it pops up on Instagram and there's an inspirational post about following your passion, of course we like it. It's almost become kind of a trope, kind of a truism. Um, but my goal tonight is to show you that helping your, your gifted child find and then nurture their passion is much more than just a feel-good endeavor. This is really critical to their long-term fulfillment. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about, first of all, we're gonna define this concept called the element. And we're gonna talk about the author who's kind of first um, hypothesized this idea that passion is vital for fulfillment. And then we're gonna talk about some steps that you can take as a parent and even a teacher, if, if there are some teachers out there, to sort of, once you've identified these areas of passion, to sort of nurture them and kind of uh, guide your gifted kid towards a life of fulfillment. So I wanna kick this off with, uh, first of all, just a note. Um, 
we will make this presentation available through, T through TEGT if possible and also on the New Minds website. But in the meantime, no need to jump out there now because we're gonna be moving kind of quickly. We only have one hour, but you do have lots of handouts with a full bibliography and references and lots more to read and research at that link there. And I'm sure TEGT would be happy to share that link at some point either tonight or later on social media. But other than that, I want to jump right in. This is so this is part one. We're going to define the element and kind of get our minds around what, what this is all about. And I love this Japanese concept called Ikigai. Some of you may have seen this in different forms. It's this philosophy, it's this concept, it's this approach to living, it's this idea that somehow the ultimate goal of our lifetime is to dwell in this sweet spot where kind of like what we really, really love to do coincides with a talent that we have or something we're good at, um, something that the world needs. And to top it off, parents, don't panic. I know you want to be practical as well. It's also about something that the world can compensate us for. And so there's this concept um, that can really drive what, what we might call our foundational philosophy. And so I posit this question, um, do we kind of agree? Is this kind of just a given that the ultimate goal of parenting would be to see our child within their lifetime kind of embodied in this ikigai state? I would, I would say that it's hard to argue against that um, from both a teacher and a parent point of view. But here's what I wanna do. I'm going to, the next slide I promise is the only kind of dark shadowy slide I'm gonna show you, but it's very important because I want to emphasize the point that tonight's topic is not just about feel good. It's not just about, you know, um, motivating, motivating our child towards happiness for some sort of um, empty trope. This is really vital. And I would argue that this, this data, as you can see, the, the trends and what they define as deaths of despair. So suicide, alcohol, drug related deaths are on a huge spike right now. And it would be my argument that this sort of state that we're in now makes this idea of Ikigai even more crucial, pragmatic and essential than ever. Um, this is not just a pie in the sky concept. This is, I would argue that happiness and this sense of internal alignment and fulfillment that we're talking about tonight is really survival itself. And what the kinds of things that are gonna fix and correct the trend on this graph that you're looking at right now, it's not, it's not necessarily more engineers and lawyers and doctors. It's not higher SAT scores. It's not higher enrollment rates in Ivy League schools. We're talking about something that really comes down to an internal alignment and a sense of balance and a sense of happiness and fulfillment from the inside out. And so I would argue that our primary role as parents right now is to counteract this, this trend on the micro scale by empowering our personal kids to kind of find that internal alignment. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. So no more depressing slides. This was just a kind of like contrast to show you that this is a real and relevant issue that we're talking about tonight. And so let's jump right into the optimism. Sir Ken Robinson, one of our favorite thinkers here at New Minds, he is an educational philosopher who spends a lot of time thinking about creativity, thinking about happiness, thinking about productivity. And fortunate for us, also a lot of time looking at schools and the school system and what it's doing um, in terms of you know, increasing, increasing levels of creativity, happiness, and fulfillment. So I love, we really love how he's gone beyond sort of like these baseline metrics of test scores and things like this, and really made it an earnest attempt to measure in some, some objective way these other factors that we're talking about tonight. So he is a proponent of this term called the element. And here's his definition. He says the element is where our natural talent meets our personal passion. So you can see he's kind of taken the Ikigai concept and simplified it. He's taken two of those circles from that quadruple Venn diagram of the Ikigai and turned it in just to a regular Venn diagram. And he says, all right, so look, I've traveled around the world and I've interviewed change makers, highly successful people, highly fulfilled people at the top of their game, at the top of their career. And here's what I've noticed. There's something that they all have in common. 
And that's that they spend most of their time or as much of their time as possible in their element. In other words, they've, they have found a way to design a life where they're kind of spending as much time as possible at this intersection between their talents and their passions. So what happened was he, he did this research and he went and wrote, th wrote this book. This is his original book called The Element. And it's, this first book is all about kind of the case studies and his hypothesis and backing it up with his research and his theories. And it, this first book really started to trend in a lot of circles um, and got people excited about this concept because it resonated, like they could feel it, right? There's kind of like this backlash against this um, standardization of education and this results driven kind of no child left behind era approach to the classroom. And so it really resonated with a lot of people, a lot of thinkers in the education world and beyond. And so they really kind of embraced this concept. And so he did not write this original book, although he is an educational philosopher, he did not write this book specifically with kids and students in mind. Um, but there's a lot of that in the book. And so, why does this matter? Like, why is this relevant? Why am I, why did we create an entire presentation for parents of gifted kids on this? And, you know, Robinson says that we're all kind of innately born with these superpowers, right? We've got imagination, we've got intelligence, feeling, intuition, kind of an innate, innocent spirituality, physical and sensory awareness. And things happen over time that these seem to diminish. One, one of the greatest and saddest examples are um, research longitudinal research that Robinson likes to cite on creativity. Um, for example, there's, there's one study that just always blows our mind. A group of 1600 kindergartners took a creativity test and scored in the 95th percentile or above. In other words, on this particular test, that was the genius level scale. And this, this particular study followed these same students across their elementary years and into junior high and high school. And the direction of that graph of the scores in that creativity test is just absolutely astonishing. By the time they graduate from high school, it's down to like 5% scoring high creativity. And what, what has happened to those kids? They've, they've, they've kind of undergone formal schooling. And so one of Robinson's biggest arguments is that the formal schooling that we're, you know, subjecting kids to these days are not encouraging these traits. In fact, we're dampening these traits um, at a high cost. You know, we're, we're emphasizing other things and we're paying the price of lower creativity, lower intuition, a lower fulfillment. And we're going to talk a lot about this and how to counteract it from a parent's point of view. So why is it that we can't access these? Like I mentioned, it's the school, the schooling system that we're going to talk more about now. Um, just a basic limitation of our understanding of these, these innate capacities that we have, kind of like the the cultural and family background and education that we're getting of what's emphasized or not. Um, how these, how, how all of these capacities kind of interact holistically. And then this, uh, the big, the big, big factor of growth versus fixed mindset and just understanding the massive potential that we have to grow in these areas. Okay. So now let's get specifically to some of the, the thoughts about school. So if we kind of all agree that, you know, I'm just going to make the assumption here with no verbal or visual feedback. That's the hardest part of a webinar. <laughs> I just have to assume that we're all aligned here. If we all assume that Ikigai is a good thing, even if I haven't convinced you yet that it's like your main goal as a parent, if you can at least concur with me that this concept of Ikigai, a life of fulfillment where you're benefiting the world, where you're earning a living, where you're living in your passion in something that you're talented at. If you're all concurring with me here that that's a good thing, then let's ask ourselves, okay, what, what is school itself during, doing to nurture these things, okay? Um, and the, unfortunately, the argument is that formal schooling is not doing a good job of nurturing these things. And why is this? Well, it's because, you know, schools innately have a preoccupation with very specific certain types of academic ability. This goes all the way back to the origins of the original IQ test, by the way, that for whatever reason, um, what's valued in our school culture right now are high abilities and words and numbers. So if you happen to have an innate passion or an innate talent for something that falls out of that range, then you may not be, you may not be on a path to have sort of your innate talents nurtured towards that Ikigai sweet spot. There's also kind of a growing hierarchy of subjects, you know, nowadays, um, STEM and fortunately increasingly STEAM 
are kind of like at the top of the food chain in terms of academic subjects. So, you know, we have our mathematics and our science and our engineering and things like that. Probably the next tier is probably humanities in general, maybe the social sciences, and then maybe the arts, and then maybe we still kind of look down a little bit on the trades. Unfortunate, says Robinson, and we agree because, you know, if your child happens to have an innate talent or passion in one of the trades and it's looked down upon, there's going to be less doors of opportunity, less opportunities for mentorship, less opportunities for that to be nurtured. And this is a big can of worms, bullet number three. We won't go too deeply onto it or jump onto our soapbox, but the reliance on standardized assessment has really kind of uh, shut down the nurturing of creativity and divergent thinking. Instead, schools have been really become really, really effective at nurturing convergent thinking. And that's, you know, deductive thinking where we take a set of data or facts and have to drive down to a single correct answer, which is a necessary thinking skill in life. We need both convergent and divergent thinking. But unfortunately, um, we've lost a huge capacity for this creativity. And we're gonna talk a little bit more th about that in a minute, okay? Okay, so what I wanna do now is uh, throw, I'll throw a few case studies out here. Now, these aren't, these aren't really, really masked. These are actual historical figures who most of you will probably recognize. But what I want you to do as we ponder these is to just think about these three main questions. And these are in your facilitator's guide as well. All right, this child that I'm describing, obviously you're gonna, you'll are gonna you be able to infer from the descriptions that we're talking about historical figures, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to project them into a modern classroom 2019 and imagine how they might fare in the classrooms based on what you know about you about your personal experience as a parent and your own and your own child in their classrooms and schools, okay? Um, since tonight's topic is about gifted kids in particular, I want you to think about, okay, from your experience um, interacting with gifted programs and modes of identification and things like that, do you think this particular child would be identified for gifted today in 2019? And finally, just to, for, the, for the sake of relevance, I want you to think about are there any commonalities between this child and your own child to help make it even more relevant for you. So, um, as in, instead of sitting here in an awkward silence and just pretending that you're reading it, I'm going to do something I wouldn't normally do. I'm going to go ahead and read the case studies to you. That will just be my way of kind of ensuring I've left enough time for you to read and also just kind of emphasize. Okay, so here's case study number one. So this, uh, this student was from an upper middle class family. His mother was musically inclined. His father was an engineer. He was a quiet child who did not speak until the age of three. He hated school. He disliked authority. He did really poorly with rote learning. His teacher said he was a slow learner who would never amount to anything. Uh, later, he became interested in science, math, and electrical engineering, but he failed the exam for entry into engineering school. Because of his interest in abstract and mathematical thought, he was interested in becoming a teacher, but his own self-confidence was so low that he believed he lacked the imagination and practical ability. So I'm not gonna reveal who it is yet, but I want you to think about it. You probably know by now, you might know by now. And just to emphasize the point, we have a couple more. Case study number two. She came from a socially prominent family. Her father was an alcoholic and she lived with her maternal grandparents. She had little affection for her mother who called her granny because of her appearance. She was sickly, bedridden, hospitalized often and wore a back brace due to a spinal defect. She bit her nails, had phobias, was shy, felt rejected and ugly, craved praise and attention, was insecure and had deep feelings of inadequacy. She was a daydreamer and she often preferred to be isolated. Eventually, after many years in school, she began to exhibit leadership qualities and she proved to be altruistic and wanted to help the elderly and the poor. Her name was, okay, so I want you, I mean, just imagine, imagine that young woman, that girl in a, in a modern classroom and, you know, what kind of opportunities she would have had with, with a teacher, um, with a student like that in his or her classroom, nominate that kid to be screened for giftedness, for example. I want you to think about that. Of course, there's lots of missing details, but I'm asking you to kind of uh, make an inference based on the information you have. Finally, case study number three. He came from a middle-class family of seven children. His father was a carpenter. He had an enlarged head at birth and was not able to talk until he was almost four years old. He was enrolled in school two years late due to scarlet fever and respiratory infections. He lost his hearing and had a high-pitched voice. His attendance in school was poor. He was stubborn, aloof, shy, self-centered, and disengaged with the learning process. 
and did not seem to care about school. One teacher even said that his brains were addled. Even though he did have an excellent memory, read well, displayed perseverance, asked questions, and was a good problem solver. He did like to build things and he did want to earn some money. His name was. Okay, so by now you've probably um, at least mentally guessed. So let's go ahead and just reveal if you haven't guessed yet. Number one was Albert Einstein himself. Number two was Eleanor Roosevelt. And number three was Thomas Edison. Although I'm personally team Tesla, I do have to respect <laughs> the very fascinating biography of Thomas Edison. And those are all actual, you know, anecdotes from their personal histories. And so I think we can all agree that these are high impact humans, whether, whether or not we want to use the term gifted or not, you know, it's debatable. It really doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is they had a huge impact on humanity and displayed many gifts in their lifetime. And I would, I'm arguing here that they did this despite their formal schooling. They all had very negative experiences with school. They were not kind of uh, thriving in a system designed to nurture their passions and kind of identify and kind of overcome obstacles in their personal lives or in the expression of their potential aptitudes. So, you know, it'd be easy to kind of say, all right, so this is our, these are, our, this was an archaic school system that they, that they were kind of growing up, coming up in. And that explains why they had such terrible experiences in school. But I'm going to argue, and in fact, Sir Ken Robinson argues repeatedly that although, you know, some things, some aspects of modern school have improved and were much more humane and compassionate and holistic, there's still a long way to go. And kids like this are still getting missed and left behind quite often. And uh, throughout the presentation tonight, you're going to see these little kind of, I guess it's lime green in the lower right corner, lime green box. And this is just to alert you to a very, very relevant topic that we're not gonna have time to go deeply into in tonight's webinar, but I wanna draw your attention to. And in particular, if you're not familiar with the six gifted profiles, I really, really recommend you do. Um, the New Minds has lots of free information out there for parents on it. We, have, we actually have parent workshops on it as well. But the point is um, the research on the profiles of gifted children reveal six unique and distinct profiles of gifted kids. And to be honest with you, of those six, only one is kind of like has an easy, easy does it time at school. That's like called type one, the successful. All the other profiles in some way or another have a lot of obstacles when it comes to performing and thriving in a regular, in a regular classroom. So if you are the parent of a child and, you know, if you're in taking part in webinars like this, there's a chance it's because you're looking for solutions to some problems you're experiencing. Um, if you're a parent of a gifted child who doesn't just sort of like, you know, flow in school and it's not necessarily an easy time for them, it's, it's highly likely that they, you know, they align with one of the profiles other than type one successful. And so the six gifted profiles are a really rich resource for interventions for parents and for schools to help these type of kiddos. And I would argue that the three profiles that we just looked at are also great examples of gifted children who don't match that successful profile, who often, often get overlooked and don't even get screened or participate in gifted programs to begin with, okay? All right, so there's also, there's another very practical reason to nurture the element, and this is part of uh, Robinson's big argument as well. And that's, you know, the fast pace of, you know, the changing workplace and the jobs of the future. It's often, you know, it's, it's, become, it's become a bit of an overused trope to say, but they say, you know, the, the jobs that our current kids will be filling and taking in their lifetimes literally don't exist yet. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. And so, you know, Robinson's argument is that a person who has learned to sort of dwell in their element. And this means that they have an internal locus of control, by the way, another hot link topic. Um, if they're kind of internally aligned and they kind of know their own talents, they know their own areas of passions, it's much easier to adapt from this sort of internal alignment than it is to kind of go chasing, you know, the hot career of the moment or to go chasing the career that you've been pressured to pursue through, you know, 
societal or cultural pressures, or dare I say, even parent parental pressures, you know? Um, that's why at the beginning of the presentation, I was talking about sort of these, you know, what I think overemphasized careers of engineering and, you know, medicine and programming and things like this. Not to say that those can't be very lucrative, excellent, fulfilling careers, they certainly can. But sometimes we, we just kind of default to these sort of go-to careers without really pausing as a parent or as a teacher and really, really taking a close look at our kids and asking ourselves, okay, what is that natural sphere of passion? Where do I see some, some aptitudes that we can nurture? And if indeed they are in the realm of engineering or medicine or whatever it might be, then by all means, let's, let's do everything we can to facilitate that. But guess what I'm saying is sometimes we need to pause and, and look a little deeper, okay? All right, just a fun little side take. If you haven't seen this site before, it's kind of fun. WillRobotsTakeMyJob.com, that is the actual URL. I recommend you go out there and just, and just take a poke. Um, as you can see, um, as a parent, I would not highly recommend my child, you know, get a get an undergrad in accounting necessarily right now because chances are, according to the research on this site, there's a 94% chance that accountants' jobs will indeed be taken over by uh, AI. Now, you know, robots is a fun way to refer to it, but we're, they're really talking about artificial intelligence and machine learning, right? And even computer programming, right? I mean, computer science programs at universities across the world are just you know, brimming with students, which is fantastic. We need programmers. They're designing the apps that make our lives go. But as ter in terms of a long-term investment as a career, there's a 48% chance or 48% of those programming jobs will be taken over by um, computers. Lawyers are safe, according to this site. So if law, if you have a little debater and a, a little logician on your hands, and they're a good communicator, then maybe law is a very possible path, very, very um, promising path for your child, okay? So I recommend you checking that out. Okay, so that was part one of, the, of tonight's webinar was just kind of laying the groundwork of defining like what is this concept called the element? Hopefully I've given you kind of a clear picture of what we mean when we talk about the element and also kind of laid the groundwork for the argument that passion is important and it's not just kind of a feel-good extra layer that it's actually the essential ingredient in long-term success so kind of back to the original story about ken robinson's book so that first book was all about the case studies you know he went around the world interviewing super achievers and not necessarily financially just people who were fulfilled kind of living in the zone kind of in a flow state a lot of the time and that's what he came back with was this hypothesis, like somehow these people have found a way to dwell in their element. And then the book, that concept got popular among a lot of circles and they went to Sir Ken and they said, Ken, we love this idea, it really resonates, but you wrote an entire book and you didn't give any advice to help us, the readers, on finding our own element and nurturing it. So he said, he kind of said, all right, fine, fine, I'll write another book. And indeed he wrote a second book called Finding Your Element. So now the next part of the next part of the presentation tonight is all about us. What we've done is we've kind of taken those concepts from Ken Robinson, added in some key insights of our own from the last many, many years of research and practice, and kind of created a little mini roadmap on finding your element and nurturing your element in terms of you as a parent helping your child. Okay, so really, um, if you only have one minute available to give someone advice on how to find their element, this is it. Paying attention to where you just naturally spend your time. And so New Minds has actually devised our own sort of like, kind of like an intake interview survey when we try to get at the root of a kid's element, when, when we're doing any kind of one-on-one -on -one coaching or, or enrichment tutoring or anything like that. And the basic question is this, um, what are you doing when time seems to stand still or disappear for you? That's one way to put it. Another way to phrase it is um, if you have, if you find yourself with an entire day or an entire weekend or an even an entire week of free time with no pressure, with no outside pressure to do anything, where do you naturally go? 
right? Where, where does your mind naturally go? What, what are you naturally drawn to? And I love this quadrant, the way it kind of lays it out. So, you know, we're pragmatic and Ken Robinson is pragmatic too. Like we have to spend time in all of these quadrants in our life and no one's saying that like you find your element and then you kind of like a float away into a cloud of bliss, you know, life still, um, life is life and it's real, but kind of like by, by thoughtfully and mindfully kind of engaging in this concept and this search, we can design a life where we can thrive by spending as much time as we can in quadrant four. And if you think about it, who wouldn't want to spend a lot of time there? Something that you're good at and that you really like. So there's kind of a trend. And I, I personally, I, I seem to see it reversing, but there's been kind of a trend over the last many years of what we call deficit thinking. This idea that um, rather than focusing on the positives and our, and our innate strengths, we're kind of focused on our deficits. And, and life is all about kind of filling in those gaps. And it's been, for many years, it was so important to be like a well-rounded person. And so, you know, if I was super talented in language arts or writing, and I was a little weaker in math, and it was all about kind of filling that gap and getting sort of that uh, supplemental um, deficit tutoring, right? And so this is kind of an opposite approach and an opposite focus. You're supposed to begin where your strengths are, begin where your innate, you know, likes are, and kind of build from that. So how do we do that, right? So this is important. Is what I just said, just emphasize here on the screen, aptitudes, not deficiencies are the base to build on. So we're gonna talk about what we're gonna focus on are kind of three approaches to this. Um, formal aptitude assessments or ac exercises, relaxation and mindfulness. What is that doing in this presentation? I just can't emphasize this enough. In fact, the more, the more times I kind of redesign and, and re-deliver this presentation, the more slides I dedicate to this number two, which is mindfulness and relaxation. And I'll talk about why in just a minute. And finally, a, a couple of super tools. You have to equip yourself and equip your child with super tools to sort of navigate this world that they're in where they can kind of block out the, the noise, and stay with that internal alignment. And that's where you as a parent can really help as well. And it's about you being aligned as well. So let's, let's talk about this. Let's talk about this first point, aptitude. So I wanna make a distinction here as well. So a lot of you parents you know, may have younger ones. You may have a kindergartner or a first grader, or even a pre-K kiddo that you're starting to think about. And it becomes really important to make a distinction between aptitudes and abilities. And, you know, aptitudes are kind of like this raw potential and they're kind of natural and innate. It's not something that's been coached or trained necessarily. Um, abilities are just manifestations of aptitudes that have been kind of coached and trained and nurtured and developed. So aptitudes are awesome. Or, sorry, abilities are awesome. You know, let's not negate them. But what we're looking for here, especially in a younger child, is a sign of aptitudes. OK, because this is going to be your foundation. This is what you build from. If you go back to the Ikigai diagram at the very beginning, I mean, this that circle of something that you're good at, uh, something that you're talented at, that's the foundation of your Ikigai. And where that intersects with your passions is most definitely the foundation of your Ikigai. So I just want to throw a couple of things out here. We're, we're not officially you know, promoting or condoning any particular formal aptitude tests, but just want to throw a few things out there if you a lot of us might remember from when we were younger even in high school we took um the the strengths finder test maybe the clifton strengths finder there is actually a new and improved iteration out there of that so if you have an older child uh, one recommendation is to invest a little bit of money the last time i checked it costs about 50 bucks and you get kind of a really formal thorough research-based reports on you know aptitudes um, based on that particular exam but what i'm here what i'm here to kind of suggest tonight is it doesn't necessarily take a formal aptitude assessment you have access as a parent already if your kid has been in school you have access to a lot of information both formal and anecdotal so for example if your child is in a gifted program it's very, very highly likely that they've taken some kind of aptitude or abilities test. And even though a minute ago I was kind of shunning abilities, um, some of those abilities tests can still be good sources of aptitude insights and information. So one example might be your child might have taken an abilities test like the COGAT, 
Um, you know, you know, a single test, as we know, does not measure a complete child. We need a holistic view of the child. However, if as a parent you have access to that COGAT data, which I highly, if you don't have it, I highly recommend as a parent, you know, accessing your right to that data. Um, the, the, the subtest scores of that COGAT test can be really, really insightful for you as a parent and kind of looking at these aptitudes and honing in, like that one's broken down into verbal, nonverbal, and quantitative subtests. That can be really enlightening to look at how those three scores kind of interplay, for example. And other, other anecdotal information, including teacher conferences, you know, asking the right questions of your teachers of kind of like, you know, of course you're going to get the grades, you're going to get the DRA reading scores, you're going to get the, the math benchmark test scores. That's, that's fine. You know, but that's not what we're talking about here. I'm talking about asking kind of like a pointed questions um, to your child's teacher about the behaviors and kind of the raw aptitudes that they're seeing manifest in the classroom. And I highly recommend you as a parent maintaining some kind of journal where you're keeping sort of like an informal log of these things that over time that you see both in terms of your child's aptitudes um, and the natural, the passions and the curiosities that they seem to in manifest. Okay. And I, I just want just to emphasize that I want to, I want to read this too. It takes much less effort to develop talent in areas where you already have an aptitude than not. And so that's, that's where the importance of identifying the aptitude comes from. Okay. Okay. Now here's the deal. Um, as I mentioned before, I really, really, the more, the more I process this information, the more I present it, the more I work with parents and coach kids on this, I just can't overemphasize how important this piece is. And the reason is we need to, to find this internal alignment that comes with sort of, you know, embracing your element and nurturing it and kind of sticking with it, with this internal locus of control, you kind of have to, to shut down the external noise. And that's, you know, noise from, from you know cultural influences, it could be noise from peers, could be noise from whatever it might be that's uh, preventing us from kind of really getting in touch with these important things like our innate aptitudes and our innate passions. So what I'm going to share tonight are just a couple of tools that are very very parent friendly, non offensive approaches to relaxation. Fortunately for us, you know, mindfulness is really trending across the culture everywhere from corporate boardrooms and to schools more and more. There's more and more fascinating research about the application of mindfulness in schools and what it's doing. Um, here's one article, one recent article from Forbes, and it cited six different benefits of meditation benefits for children specifically. So now we're getting more and more research focused specifically on children, you know, increased attention and attendance improves. If there's outside trauma, they get a slight reprieve from that mental health. And you know, five and six are the ones I wanna emphasize for tonight. And that's that self-awareness, which is, that's really what, what kind of the element is all about, is kind of dwelling in that self-awareness and kind of knowing your strengths, knowing your ap aptitudes, building on those, that self-regulation and that social emotional development where's where the communication piece comes in. And there's a couple of techniques when I do this presentation live, whether it's for parents or for teachers, um, I do kind of like a, a guided meditation of this technique called box breathing. And obviously in the, in the webinar format, I'm not able to do that, but in the facilitator's guide, I provided uh, two different links. One really, really apt for younger students and one a little bit better for older students. It's a guided meditation on box breathing. And it basically looks like this. It's a, it's a four second, four second process where you kind of go through filling your lungs and holding it and releasing and holding it. And there's lots of physiological benefits. It's very easy to learn. You can do it if you have anywhere from one minute to 10 minutes available, you can do it any time of day. And uh, it's very powerful. So, but I want to end, I'm kind of want to end this section on mindfulness with a couple of app recommendations. Um, you know, we live in a modern world where we have supercomputers in our pocket, so why not utilize them, right, in this pursuit for our ikigai or our element? So these are a few that we always recommend to parents. We wouldn't recommend them if we didn't use them personally. I've personally used all of these before. There's a fascinating app called Mood Meter where uh, it builds EQ, emotional intelligence, by allowing you or your child to kind of plot their mood 
on a daily basis. And it kind of, first of all, it builds that kind of uh, emotional vocabulary, that mood vocabulary, which is part of EQ, and also gives little hacks and, and techniques to kind of move and adjust your mood. Very fascinating. In terms of a guided meditation, there's a really highly rated and, you know, well-reviewed app called Headspace, which I recommend. Um, just in general, in terms of sort of this of quieting the outside noise and kind of tuning in internally, there's a lot of there's a lot to say for kind of being tuned into your dreams. And uh, there's an app that I personally use called Dreamcatcher. It's very fascinating. And just this last one I threw in there um, as a kind of like counterpoint to sort of the noise, the negative noise of the news. This is actually a news feed, but it's very its specific mission is to feed your 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 news feed, an alternative news feed with only positive, fascinating, mind blowing things. So I highly recommend that as well. Okay, uh, this next section is about super tools. Okay, so another thing Robinson recommends and one thing at New Minds that we've really focused on over the last several years is, okay, um, we've, we've stepped out of the traditional school system and so what we want to do is bring some new tools to the table that kids and parents can have in their pocket to sort of like superpower themselves. And one that we just can't get enough of that I can't recommend highly enough is mind mapping. And if, if you're like me and dating myself a little bit here, but we grew up in school creating uh, these very, very linear sort of outlines. I just remember like, you know, outlining entire chapters of textbooks with the Roman numeral system. Okay, throw that all out the window. All the race, all the research on, you know, memory and recall and processing and depth of learning points to this, you know, more modern technique of mind mapping. And there's a lot to it. There's, I provided a link, again, a facilitator's guide. And we're not going to have time to get too deeply into it right now. But I just, it's, this is a tool that, improves you know the depth of processing as i mentioned it it facilitates you know information processing for all types of learners not just the traditional linear you know verbal learners as you can see from the sample mind map it's very visual the hierarchy of ideas is shown in alternative ways so it's a very powerful super tool that we can't recommend enough here's your uh, lime green highly relevant topic link Convergent versus divergent thinking skills. Mind mapping is all about developing and nurturing those divergent thinking skills. And I've already talked about that topic, so I won't bring that up again. I want to make sure I, I get to all the good information and leave time if possible for a little Q&A at the end. Okay, here's another, another step in the process. Um, and remember, this, this kind of you know, continuum of self-awareness and kind of this uh, inner, the science of inner knowledge, you might call it, is uh, we got to quiet down the noise, and that's what that first part was about, right? Like, let's tune into let's tune into our natural aptitudes. Let's uh, let's have some tools in our pocket to kind of kind of stay in touch with this rich, natural, innate inner world that we have, and then let's expand this self knowledge so we can kind of design the this life in this world that's going to you know most benefit us, and so and the world around us. So learning styles right and this is not the same thing as multiple intelligences so that that can be a powerful tool as well but this is this is a very simple tool a very simple assessment called the vark analysis and it's all about like how do we process information and and for this particular assessment there's four different ways to process information we've got our visual our auditory reading and writing and kinesthetic and just the simple fact of understanding your preference um, can help you kind of design a world where you're processing information that works best for you and not just taking the default mode, okay? You as a parent can probably know your child well enough right now to just make an assumption, but if your child is a little bit older and they're able to take the VARC analysis, I highly recommend it. And like, like I say on this slide, this meta-awareness can kind of shape how you help your child approach the world to access information in a way that works best for them to set themselves up for high levels of success. All right, here's another super tool, the SWOT analysis. Now, this sounds so simple on the surface, but it's a powerful tool. It's a powerful tool. It's used in the business world and also personal development. And we highly recommend it for, for you as a parent to kind of coach your child. So they're going to overcome obstacles you know, regardless, right? And on this sort of this lifelong quest for Ikigai, they're gonna need tools 
for overcoming obstacles that they come across. And one of these, one of these power tools is the SWOT analysis. And it's just um, a quadrant. And as you can see from the diagram, there are internal and external factors that we kind of take into consideration that we kind of pause and reflect on. And the goal here is to kind of bring a new light of awareness to whatever problem we're facing. And so there are fancy, I, I, I gave you a link on the facilitator guide to kind of a more, a more fancy template that you can print and adapt. But really all you need is a piece of notebook paper or computer paper and a pen or pencil. And you can do a SWOT analysis. You just divide the paper into four sections and whatever particular problem you're facing in that moment, that's your focus. So what I always do is I write that across the top of the paper. I draw my four quadrants and then you kind of take a moment, you pause, could be a great moment to implement one of those relaxation techniques. And you take a moment and you kind of go through the four quadrants and you, and you kind of list out, okay, in this particular moment, this problem I'm facing, what are the strengths that I bring to the table right now? And you can see some prompt questions here. What are, what are some weaknesses that I in particular bring to the table in terms of this problem okay externally what are some opportunities that this situation is bringing about that i can take advantage of and what are some external threats that are making it difficult for me to come across this to kind of conquer this obstacle this situation and so the idea here is not a magical solution you know suddenly popping out but the, the, the act of doing this deep processing with the problem or the obstacle kind of brings new light, bring, brings new awareness to it. And uh, it can have some very, very powerful effects. So a very simple tool. Again, there's a link to that in the facilitator's guide. Um, this is another, another aspect of overcoming obstacles, and that is to find a tribe, help your, help your child find their tribe sometimes you might get really lucky and this might be their peers at school and if so congratulations that's going to be a huge booster to you as a parent on this kind of this journey and you know there's, there's so many benefits to having the right tribe you know you get affirmation you get guidance you're able to collaborate you find inspiration you get reinforcement and this is important for any human being but in the gifted world in particular, if you're familiar at all with any of the research, um, including the, you know, the fabulous Nation Deceived study, the importance of intellectual peers, sometimes referred to idea peers, is you know, so important. It can't, be, it can't be overstated how important intellectual peers are for the development of gifted kids. Not to mention, not to mention, um, but we at New Minds really embrace these 21st century skills. They're often called the four C's. This is a, this came out of a, a number of studies endorsed by the United Nations. And there are these four particular skills that always keep popping up on these studies for what are the most relevant 21st century skills. You know, they're called the four C's because they're critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, and communication, all things that happen when you're thriving in your tribe. So that's why they're here. Okay. And if you'll forgive me, the one, the one kind of like selfish, shameless plug is just emphasizing that that's exactly why New Minds exists, is we, we're here to help kids connect with their tribe, to thrive, and to practice these, these 21st century learning skills as much as possible. Okay, so I don't want to end this, section, end this section without another quick roundup of some applications, because these are also tools. Since we're talking about tools, that you want to equip your child with as they kind of navigate this process. Um, you know, we've got Wonderlist, which is a traditional, uh, it's based on the traditional to-do list. It's a modern app version of the to-do list with all of the, the excellent sound effects and, you know, sensory gratifications when you complete a task. And so it's like a, a very complex, you know, to-do list. And like I said, since students have the, the access to these devices and if, if it's a situation where they're allowed to use the devices then why not harness the full power if you want a more simple system for tracking information we got google keep if you're looking for the the most advanced you know version of almost a searchable personal database we've got evernote and uh, we're really big about the development of daily habits and so habit bowl and there's other very similar apps out there for setting and tracking daily habits to kind of reinforce these long-term goals. 
Okay, so we're kind of we're kind of almost coming full circle here, pun kind of intended, because one of our one of our intellectual heroes is the anthropologist Joseph Campbell, and uh, one of one of his major contributions to humanity is this concept of called the monomyth, and is also known as the hero's journey, and we feel really strongly that um, the journey of a child, and, and in particular a gifted child sort of from wherever they are now to the full expression of their gifts and you know what we're calling today their ikigai is a hero's journey full of obstacles and challenges and uh you know joseph campbell's argument and hypothesis was that this is kind of the underlying story that undergirds all stories everything from you know myths across the world to star wars to harry potter you know and so kind of by understanding and embracing this we, it gives us a little bit of courage, right? We're, we're sort of called to this greater adventure of leaving our comfort zone. And we want to we want to seek kind of the full expression of our child's gifts. So we're going to encourage them to take on challenges and move through these obstacles. And this quote from Joseph Campbell, you know, kind of sums it all up. He says, uh, when you follow your bliss, you kind of find yourself on this on this track, on this journey, on this path that just feels right. Like it feels like it's natural. And he says doors are going to open for you where they didn't before. So sure, it may be a bit of a leap of faith, but kind of when we're aligned with sort of this, this inner sense of purpose, that's when we kind of get reinforced. And according to Campbell, that's when kind of these hidden hands seem to kind of come into play and help us out. And these doors open for us. All right. So looking a little bit more into this research on happiness, this is from a book called The How of Happiness. And uh, according to, to the research in this particular book, here's how they break it down. They say, all right, what does happiness depend on? All right, all right, genetics, right? Something a bit out of our control. But there are some things in our control, um, our, whatever our current life circumstances are, they're arguing that only about 10% of our happiness relies on that and 40% of our happiness is our internal state of mind. You know what? I'll take that. I will take that 40% that's totally in my control and I want to equip myself with all the tools to sort of contribute to this internal state of mind that's what we're talking about today I want to have the right mindset to make the right life decisions um, to kind of control this 40 percent and also influence that 10 percent of my circumstances with the right attitude and effort so I always I always consider this a very encouraging piece of data and graph to kind of like just reinforce this idea that, you know, Ikigai is not some kind of pie in the sky, feel good concept. It's sure it's an ideal, but it's, it's a very realistic endeavor to sort of design your life to move towards that ideal. All right. And just to kind of uh, three, three points of summation that, you know, that we've drawn from Sir Ken Robinson's work and our own and just helping your child by reinforcing kind of these points as well. Um, your each life is unique, right? Like you can get inspiration from others, but you can't copy them. It, each journey is kind of this wonderful, organic unfolding. And we encourage you to embrace that. You know, one of the growing trends that we deal with as, you know, education providers and coaches and, and workshop facilitators is the, you know, the trap of perfectionism. And what we're talking about today, the element and embracing your element is really the best, you know, way to counteract this because the element is innate and it's organic and it's unique to each child. And that's really what it's about. And helping your child feel empowered that they have the power to create and recreate their own life and imagination and possibility are big pieces of the equation and emphasizing again that life is organic and messy and not linear. So it's, we can't plan it all out to a T, but we can plan the next steps. So it's not about sort of this uh, passive, let it happen. We want to set goals and we want to equip ourselves with the tools, but at the same time, we kind of want to embrace the organic aspect of the journey. Okay. So just a quick, a quick review of the key points and kind of like the major roadmap. So number point number one is this concept of Ikigai. Like, can we agree? that maybe, just maybe, the ultimate goal of education and parenting is to help our kids get on a track towards Ikigai. 
and kind of live a life of fulfillment where they're contributing to the world and feeling rewarded for it. Okay, number two, how do we get there, okay? We have to understand our own aptitudes and have this deep sense of self-knowledge and an internal compass, right? And we get there by using the right tools, right? And so I emphasize relaxation and mindfulness to sort of like tune into this inner compass, but there's also external tools and thinking techniques and methods like mind mapping and the apps on our phone and things like this that can be part of the package as well. And finally, finding that tribe that resonates with you and just remembering from a gifted point of view, this concept of asynchronous development. And it's not about when your kid was born, right? It's not about chronological age. Um, it's really about the, often at New Minds, we call it brain age, but intellectual peers are much more important than chronological peers. So just remember that. So we've gone through a lot in the last hour. It's We've got about two minutes left of the official time. And so there are several topics that we were just able to kind of brush up against that are very relevant. So if anything that I spoke about tonight just kind of intrigued you or sparked like, I gotta know more, um, we, have, we have workshops. So this is a way to reach out to us and let us know if one of these workshops especially sounds enticing to you and you think would be extremely valuable. Um, this is what we love to do. This is our area of expertise. We love working with parents, with teachers, and obviously with kids. If you, you know, if you're looking for opportunities for your kid, our, our kid programs are spreading across the state of Texas and beyond. And our flagship student program is called Camp Pursuit. And it really, really embraces everything from tonight's talk about the element. We, in fact, we design all of our programs to facilitate this kind of innate pursuit of your cut your child's element and that full expression of kind of like their beautiful innate selves and finally at a personal level i would love to continue the conversation i love you know you know not from not from for any selfish reason at all just because it's kind of like part of my ikigai is working with teachers and parents and kids directly on on this personal development self-development to kind of transform the educational landscape like as you heard from from my bio when, uh, when Pauline was reading that. So these are a few ways to reach out to me. I would love to get personal emails. Um, if you're more on the visual side, on Instagram or professional side, LinkedIn, reach out. I would love to hear feedback about this. Open questions you have. And I'm gonna stop there and I'm gonna ask our hosts at TEGT if there are any questions that came up on the Q&A that we might be able to try to address right now. Hi, Ben. I don't see any, but let's give everybody just a moment to type anything in that they would like to learn more about. Excellent. The facilitator's guide was sent out with the link um, uh, to this uh, webinar. So if you don't have that, we will definitely follow up with that um, uh, on our email tomorrow, um, as long as, as well as the um, the additional resources. Okay, well, seeing, um, let's see, a couple more questions, actually. Um, from Ashley, would you recommend a gifted student skipping a grade if they score high in two areas on the COGAT test? Yeah, great question. So it's going to be tough to give precise advice. However, in general, in general, I'm a proponent of acceleration if it allows your child to thrive with intellectual peers. Now, that's a a hot button topic in, in school districts and schools across the state, different policies. But in concept, in principle, yes, I am, I am for, and New Minds in general is for acceleration when it can benefit the, the child by allowing them to interact with intellectual peers. I see, a, I see a question here about the slides, Paulina. Are you gonna, if, I'm, if I give you a copy of the presentation, are you able to get it out to all of the participants from tonight? Absolutely. Okay, fantastic. Um, are there any uh, great questions for parents to ask teachers and in, um, in the areas that you discussed today? 
Yeah. So good question. So of course, there's all of the regular questions you want when you go into a, a meeting with a with a teacher. They're all of kind of the objective questions you want to get. Any data available you want to get. So you know what are the math scores? What's the reading score? That's all good to have. But what I recommend is kind of uh, going beneath the surface a bit and asking you know, the question that might surprise the teacher a little bit. You know, like you know when my when my child has free time in class and they finish their work, what do they do? What kinds of questions does my child ask you? Um, you know, when, this sounds strange, but when do you see my child's face light up in class? You know, and what we're trying to get at is where that innate curiosity is sort of shining through. And those are just as important clues as sort of that objective data. That was a, that was a great question, by the way. I think that was Cheryl. Yeah, and to kind of build on that, how do you push forward some ideas presented on mindfulness and super tools with both your your GT child and um, their educators? Yeah, another excellent question. So that's kind of why I recommend some of those apps in particular, because often, just for whatever reason, if there's a tech component, our kids seem to be more predis predisposed to be open-minded about it. So with a child, I might recommend like, hey, hey, so-and-so, hey, Ben, hey, Ben Jr. I found, I heard about this very cool app that kind of helps you relax. Do you want to try it out on the iPad here? And you just kind of like make it almost like an experiment. You don't want to like, you know, stuff it down their throat or, or kind of kill the joy of it and just see like how they react to it and see if you can make it a habit. Now with teachers, that could be a little bit more sensitive. It might be, um, it might be sharing an article, you know, you know, really reputable institutions like Harvard and Stanford are doing studies on meditation in schools and showing the benefits. And it might be a matter of bringing that up in a conversation with a teacher or, or sending them a link via email and, and suggesting. I, I recommend a delicate approach with the teacher, but just seeing how like open they might be and what kind of school atmosphere, you know, and if it be if it would be conducive to that. Great. Um, here's the here's one from uh, the Perry family. Do you have any background on how a parent can encourage and motivate um, aptitudes into abilities without projecting our own egos or risk burning our child out? Yeah. Wow. That is a a deep and powerful question. Okay. So I don't think I see that one in front of me here. So can you repeat it one more time, Paulina? Yes. Um, let's see when <laughs> went into a different thing. Here we go. Um, do you have any background in how a parent can encourage and motivate aptitudes into abilities without projecting our own egos or risk burning out our child? Yeah, great question. So number one, I'm not sure if that's assuming that you already have some insight into the aptitudes, but let's say you do, let's say for some, you've gathered data, maybe they even took like the, the Clifton Strength Finders or something like that, and you have access to the data. And now you don't want to overkill, right? You don't want to over schedule or force feed them into some program and burn them out like happens all the time. Like, you know, for example, piano lessons, right? It starts off fun, but it gets so intense that they just burn out, whatever it might be. So putting the opportunities, leaving some element of choice, and putting the opportunities out there for them and making it more of a casual exploration and letting their kind of natural inclinations guide the conversation and the decisions. So for younger students in particular, this is just a piece of advice I always give parents in, in coaching situations. I kind of recommend for young students at elementary age to, in terms of extracurricular activities, to have um, you know, one, one kind of physical extracurricular so whether it's a sport, individual or team sport, um, one artistic extracurricular, whether that's music or visual arts or something like that, and one sort of academic or enrich enrichment extracurricular at a time. And so those elementary years are kind of like the sampler platter years, right? And they're kind of going through and sampling and you as a parent, maybe you have that journal I, I talked about earlier, but you as a parent kind of go making anecdotal and subjective observations about how your child's reacting to these different things and when they're lit up and when they're naturally, you know, wanting to go and when they're showing kind of like resistance and they don't want to go tonight and I don't feel good tonight and making those observations. And then over time, it sort of naturally hones itself. And hopefully the ideal scenario as a parent is that you're not having to push. It's just sort of an organic 
process. Now, I love how the parent who asked that question brought up the concept of ego because that's the toughest part of parenting in this way. It's kind of letting go of our own expectations because we might consider ourselves the most progressive, enlightened parents, but we still have these innate ideas about like some careers are a little better than others. Some pursuits are a little better than others. And we, we may find our child organically being drawn to an area that we don't consider, you know, like um, of, as high value as we'd like. And so that's where kind of the ego piece comes in. And that's where you just kind of have to let go. And what I found is if the parent, him or herself, does a lot of inner work themselves and kind of and take a look at, okay, where am I on this Ikigai chart? And where have my own you know, expectations and experiences informed what I'm projecting onto my child? Um, that helps a lot too. Because I think when your child, especially as he or she gets older, see you doing some of the self work and asking those questions, it, it helps kind of like model that. That's great. Yeah. There was um, another question about um, how to get a GT student who's passionate in one topic exclusively to move on um, to other interests or be successful in other areas of uh, their schoolwork. I think you answered that around um, the extracurricular kind of um, suggestions you had here. Yeah. Um, I'm seeing. I, I, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say one thing to add to that that's very helpful is when you look at the six gifted profiles. And like I said, most of those gifted profiles are not extrinsically motivated. They're not, they're not pleasers. They're not motivated by grades or, or traditional performance in school. So the research on the gifted profiles has lots of interventions for the other types and how to get them motivated and engaged, even in areas where they're not super passionate and curious. Okay, sorry about that. So you had, you had another one, Paulina? Yeah, I've got a couple on here about... Um, negotiating cell phone um ipad video games and how to encourage your child so that they they kind of want to be successful in the in their areas of uh, ability or aptitude do you have any suggestions around that i know that's honestly that's kind of like the million dollar question and like when we get when we get the ultimate solution for that we'll write the book and we'll be on oprah and everything <laughs> but in the meantime in the meantime it's a it's a very particular individual family thing, you know, like uh, in terms of like strict screen time restrictions and things like that, I hesitate to give specific advice only to say that as a family, you need to find some, some balance point that works for you. But I'll say two things. The only, the only kind of place that I'm a stickler for it that I highly recommend is meal times are definitely zero tech. And Step one is you as a parent have to model that. Your phone is nowhere nowhere near and you're just present with the family and by modeling that, you're implying the same thing for your child. So no devices at all during meal times. That's the only place where I sound kind of like a, a stodgy old man, but I kind of stick to it. And then number two, fine, you know, we, you know, we can't put our heads in the sand and pretend that devices are going away because they're not. And they're getting more and more, um, you know, ubiquitous in classrooms. So we're really better off just leveraging them and embracing them. And that's one reason why I included app suggestions here. So it's like, okay, so your child's gonna have his iPad out or his tablet or his computer or phone out in the afternoon after school, right? Um, sure, maybe you're allocating and allowing some game time, but why not also get them involved in some of these apps that we talked about? Why not have them, okay, um, I want you to plot your mood on mood meter before you, before you do Minecraft. Let's see how that's going. I want you to enter today's homework in, in Wonderlist, you know, before you watch that YouTube channel for a while. You know, things like that, that are kind of like a, a negotiation, but it's like showing that, all right, this technology can be leveraged for super productivity and it can be a tool for you and not just sort of an, an empty calorie entertainment tool. Great. Um, okay, just let's do one more. Uh, we've got two actually who are talking about um, sensitive gifted children um, who are having a hard time moving on from um, bullying um, and or are sensitive around being coached or, or corrected. So there's some some theme there a little bit a little bit to two pronged question. Yeah, excellent. So I'm going to give a quick shortcut answer because I know we're about to end here, but this will allow the those parents to look a little deeper. Um, the research on overexcitabilities is a, a, 
a rich place to look for answers to the sensitivity issue. Um, for, for whatever reason, here's the, here's the super short version. For whatever reason, um, gifted individuals are wired a little bit differently and we're, we, we can be highly sensitive in one or more of five different areas. And one of those can be em emotional sensitivity in particular, it can be sensory sensitivity. And so there are some ways to sort of like overcome this. And it, there's, there's research on overexcitability to give specific interventions. And so it's, it's hard to give general advice um, without knowing the child or speaking more directly to the parent. But the good news is there are interventions out there if you look at the research on overexcitabilities. Great. Well, thank you, Ben. Uh, if there are any unanswered questions, you um, you know how to reach him or, or TAGT. We're here to be your resource. Um, ben, we really appreciate you sharing your time and passion with our parent community. Um, and thank you to each and every one of you out there who participated this evening. Um, as we've mentioned a couple times, this webinar has been recorded and will be available on our website, txgifted.org, this week. Uh, make sure you take a look there for the facilitator's guide and uh, we'll get Ben's slides posted as well. If you participated in a group, small or large, please remember to take advantage of the facilitator's guide and spend just a few minutes together reflecting on what you've heard. Um, also, if you're in a group, we'd love to see, uh, or, or a singleton, uh, we'd love to see um, and sh see you and share your, if you will share your photos um, by emailing them to tagt at txgifted.org. Uh, you will receive a feedback survey to let us know what you thought about tonight, so please share your thoughts with us by email. Um, and finally, TAGT is only able to provide resources like this one. Uh, with the support of our members. So please consider joining TAGT to show your support for this organization and GT students uh, across our state. Visit tasgifted.org slash explore dash membership uh, for more information. Our sincerest thank you, Ben, and to everyone out there, we hope to see you very soon and have a wonderful evening. Thank you.